Well, I told JR last night that I was planning on getting up and apologizing to you good folks for making JR a new preacher. Uh, I, I did do that impression a few years back and uh, I noticed that his legs stopped bouncing as much. <laughs> so you guys are probably familiar with. But, uh, and I, I feel the same way toward Mr. JR. Uh, he's a good man. And you guys have a blessing in J.R. Brunger. And I consider him a father in the faith, and I have for a long time. So I appreciate you guys having me here with you. I appreciate seeing Mark Fisher as well. We were, he was my first chapel buddy at FC, and we were also next-door neighbors uh, in our uh, apartment complex, I guess you would call it, in uh, Boswell Hall, and so good to see him as well. And uh, me and Carrie really appreciate being here with you all. Well, let's dig right into the Word. In Isaiah chapter 6, if you'd like to turn your Bibles over there, that's where we're going to be spending all of our time, really, this morning. We really touched on a couple of things already in the Revelation class, and appreciate that class being taught. There's a couple of various visuals that you see in the book of Revelation, chapter 15 even, that you also see in Isaiah chapter 6. And I know that JR has talked to you folks about the idea of Isaiah chapter 6 before, but I want us to look at the chapter in its entirety to try to get a picture of what the prophet Isaiah is trying to picture for us. Trying to figure out exactly what God wants us to draw from this. And as we look at this passage, we're going to be seeing that the Lord is on His throne. The Lord is on His throne. It starts off by saying, in the year of King Isaiah's death. Now, an interesting way to start the chapter, and you might think that, okay, that's just a good place marker to help you figure out, okay, this is whenever this prophecy happened. But it's so much more than that. Because what he is trying to do, he's trying to help us understand the background story. He's trying to help us understand that this is the year of King Isaiah's death. And when you think Isaiah, you think someone who it's a time of great prosperity, a time of peace, a time whenever things were going well. You know, we think about times like the good old days that people talk about. That, that you think about the good old days and how they, times were so much easier back then. Well, that was this kind of time period. The year of King Isaiah's death would have been a time of great turmoil. A time whenever you think, well, if this man could die. What's that going to say about our nation? What's that going to say about where we're going from here? And, and so as we think about that, we think right after he says that was the first statement that said, the Lord is on his throne. No matter what king dies, no matter what president dies, no matter what good man dies, the Lord is on his throne. And that will never change. The Lord will always be reigning no matter what time period that we are in, whether it's good times or whether it's bad times. So that kind of sets up the background story. But I want us to look at the full picture of chapter 6. Because in the full picture of chapter 6, it's going to help us to understand when we see God on his throne, that's going to do some amazing things for us. Seeing God on his throne does some absolutely fantastic things and awesome deeds in us. It'll change our lives if we could see God on His throne. Isn't that right? If we could see God on His throne, how would that change us? I, I sometimes give the analogy of sometimes when you see something just absolutely awe-inspiring, it often changes your life. Just think of the most beautiful picture in your mind. So, some of you might think of something like the Grand Canyon, something like uh, the Statue of Liberty, something like seeing your wife walking down the aisle at your wedding. Just that beautiful thing in mind, and then you think, I need to be a different man. I need to be someone who is better than what I am right now. It changes your life whenever you see awe-inspiring things. And seeing the Lord on His throne is the essence of awe-inspiring. And so seeing the Lord 
on his throne. The first thing I want us to notice from the first four verses, appreciate Justin, right? Uh, oh, I'm sorry, excuse me, uh, brother. Levi, all right, sorry, I got one of those mixed up. Levi, appreciate Levi reading that for us. But we want to see that seeing God on his throne, you're Justin, aren't you? Seeing God on his throne, <laughs> it instills godly fear. It instills godly fear. Let's take a look at these verses once again that we had in our hearing this morning. It says, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne. And the first way that it describes this throne is it is lofty and exalted. You know, we often, whenever we say, get someone off of their pedestal, we're meaning that in a bad way. Well, when we're talking about God's throne being lofty and exalted, we're talking about putting him on his pedestal. We're talking about putting him where he belongs. That he ought to be something that is lofty and exalted, high above everything else. The Lord the king is so great that even his throne is higher than any other throne on earth. It continues on with the illustration and it says, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Now whenever we think of clothing, typically in our time period, we don't often think about the idea of that our clothes really represent like regality or something like that. Uh, we're just not in that same kind of time period anymore. But in this time period, whenever they would look at clothing, the more expensive your clothing, the more grandiose your clothing, that represented how much in power you were. And so whenever you see God's train of his robe, and that's the part of the clothing that just rubs across the floor, that you pick up all the dirt as you're walking along the way, probably the most uh, worthless parts of the clothing. And yet even that was so great that it filled up the entire temple. This passage instills godly fear. And it fills it up so much that when we see in just a moment, not even the seraphim could touch the ground because of how great this robe was. It filled up the temple. And now let's talk about those seraphim. It said that these seraphim stood above him. And, and that phrase above him is not talking about in authority kind of way. But the phrase above him often is talking about the sense of that they were servants of the one who was on the throne. And so they're servants of the one who is on the throne. And it has, says that there are six wings that each of these seraph have. And you have these seraphim, and each of these wings have, are covering various parts. First, you see that two wings are covering their eyes. We can maybe understand what that's talking about. It's talking about that even the angels, even the angelic beings, the seraphim, even they could not look upon the glory of God. And I want us to notice something here for just a side note. Whenever we talk about the glory of God. There's just a few times that it talks about the Lord sitting on his throne. Now there's multiple times really, but only a few times that it really describes the picture. And each of those times are in a time whenever oppression is about to come on the people of God. You have back uh, in Ezekiel chapter 1 that Babylon is about to come and oppress the people of God. You have an Isaiah that Assyria is about to come and oppress the people of God. You have in the book of Revelation, which we mentioned this morning, that Rome is about to oppress the people of God. And in those times, that's when he brings out this throne room scene. But in each of these pictures that we're seeing, we're seeing the appearance of the glory of God. The glory of God is so great we would not be able to survive the experience if we saw it. Look over in Ezekiel chapter 1 for just a moment. Ezekiel chapter 1. This is not a throne room scene that we see here. And at the very last verse, I'll start at the beginning, but it's really the second half that we're going to take notice of. It says, like the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud on the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness of all around. Now here's the point. Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of God. So you see this full throne room scene. 
But it's not really the glory of God. You see this great picture, but it's not really all that could be depicted. Some of you guys use Instagram, I'm sure. And there's something in Instagram, by the way, that's an internet-based website for anyone that does not know. And it's a place where you put all your pictures online so that all your friends can see. Well, they have something called Throwback Thursday. You guys familiar with that? Throwback Thursday. And what you do is you take a picture of when you were a little kid or just a few years ago and you put it on there so that people can see. So sometimes, whenever you don't have a scanner, what you do is you take a picture of a picture. And whenever you take a picture of something in any sense, like if I took a picture of all you right now, that wouldn't really give me the feel of exactly uh, how large the auditorium is when I'm looking at that picture. Uh, you know, it wouldn't give me a full idea of what's going on in that picture at the moment. You have to be there. But the picture is still a depiction of that image. Well, then, sometimes on Throwback Thursday, you take a picture of a picture. And even that is just a little faded. It's just a little bit more blurry that you can't see just as well as it was before. And so whenever we're talking about the glory of God, Ezekiel describes it as this is the likeness, the appearance of the likeness of the glory of God. God is so great that we can't see him in all his glory. And God is so great that we can't even see a picture of him in all his glory. And God is so great that we are so far removed from how great he is that it is the likeness of the appearance of the glory of God. That is how great and awesome our God is. So when we go through all these images, notice that not a single one of them actually talk about God. Every single one of these are talking about something surrounding God himself. And so if we go back and we see that his throne is lofty, if his throne is lofty, what does that say about him? And even if his clothes are filling the entire temple, what does that say about him? And if the seraphim can't look upon him because of how great he is, and they cover their feet because they don't want to show their most lowly parts to him, and they're spreading their wings because they can't even touch the floor because its train is filling the temple. If the seraphim are so great, how great is our God? And you go on down with the analogy. Then one of the angels shouts out and he says, Holy, holy, holy. We mentioned that statement just a few moments ago. Of how that song is actually taken from Revelation chapter 15. But we see that phrase, holy, holy, holy here. Whenever you see any one idea about God being said, you better believe it's important. If it says God is love, you better believe God is love. But if it says that God is great, God is great. In the Hebrew language and in the Greek language, they would say things a couple of times to make sure that you got the picture. And so if you say God is great, God is great, you better believe God is great. But this is the only word, holy, this is the only word that it describes God thrice. It says, holy, holy, holy. If I could say it this way, that is crazy importance. That is the most important attribute of our God, that he is holy. Because if he is holy, we're about to see, what does that say about us? If God is so great, when God is so holy, that means he is set apart. Someone that is entirely different from anything else. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now, another way that we could say that is the fullness of the whole earth is his glory. Now, that's not saying in the pantheistic idea that this uh, table is God, and this pew is God, and this suit jacket is God. That's not what it's talking about here. It, what it's talking about is that in everything that you see around you, God had a hand in it. God is the creative force behind everything. And as Romans chapter 1 and verse 20 says, people ought to know just by seeing all the creation around them, they ought to know how great our God is. We have that depicted here as well. 
But notice whenever he shouts this out, this seraphim, the shout is so great that the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out. If this seraphim's voice is so great, you know where I'm going with this? How great is God's voice going to be in just a moment? If this seraphim's voice is shaking even the thresholds of the temple, and the thresholds of the temple would have been the strongest part. It's like the thresholds of our door have to be the strongest part so that everything else doesn't cave in on top of it. This is the strongest part of the temple, and even it was shaking because of the voice of the seraphim. What does that say about our God? If these are so great, our God is so much greater. And then actually one of your questions in the Bible class was what was the smoke depictive of? Well, it says while the temple was filling up with smoke. We could look at a couple of passages having to do with this. We could look at Revelation chapter 15, and I know J.R. will talk about that a little bit more later on. But we could also look at 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 22, verses 1 through 9, really. We won't take the time to read it. But in that passage, it talks about his nostrils throwing out smoke. So you get this picture of like a fire-breathing dragon. And this fire-breathing dragon has this smoke expelling from his nostrils. Whenever smoke is expelling from a dragon's nostrils in any movie, stuff is not going to be good to follow. You can believe that it is going to be a most difficult time for whoever's in front of that dragon. Well, the same thing is happening with God himself. As smoke fills up the temple, as smoke filled up the temple in Solomon's day, and as smoke was what was guiding the Israelites through the wilderness, and as smoke came through the halves in Genesis chapter 15 when Abraham was making a covenant with God, with each of those occurrences, it not only depicted the glory of God, but it depicted the wrath of God. And that makes sense when you look at the context of chapters 1 through 5 of Isaiah. Chapters 1 through 5 talks about, guess what? Destruction's coming. And it's coming soon. You guys better get ready. And it makes sense whenever you look at the next few verses in this chapter. Whenever Isaiah's response is, woe is me. He recognizes his state before God. And that leads us right into the second point. We understand that seeing the Lord on His throne instills godly fear. But seeing the Lord on His throne also produces godly sorrow. It produces godly sorrow. Let's take a look at verse 5. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. We'll look back at his response to this scene. As he looks up, Isaiah also looks inward. As Isaiah looks above, he looks to himself as well. Because he sees how great God is. And then whenever we see how great God is, do we not see the difference in us? Do we not see how totally inept we are before God? He is holy, holy, holy. We're unholy. He says here, I am ruined. We can also translate that, I am silenced before God. It's the same way that Habakkuk says, whenever the Lord is in his holy temple, let all the earth keep silence before him. I'll ask you guys, and you probably know the answer in your mind, when do we usually sing that song? You sing it right at the beginning. You sing it right at the beginning because what we think about that song is the Lord's here Let's all make sure we're as quiet as a little mouse. But that's not the point of the song. And that's not the point of Habakkuk. 
The point of Habakkuk is, and excuse me for just a moment, parents, but the point of Habakkuk is the Lord is in his holy temple. He is great. He is everything. And we need to shut up. We need to sit down and listen. Listen to what he has to say. The Lord is sitting on his throne. He is everything. We're nothing before him. He is the great and awesome God. And we need to sit down and listen. And that's the point here. I am dumbfounded before God. And he says, I'm a man of unclean lips. Now, we would maybe take a look at that and we could make illustrations of how we need to stop cursing. And we need to stop talking like this. We need to wash out our mouths with soap. But whenever it talks about a man of unclean lips, it gives a different picture in the Old Testament. It gives a picture of someone who is unclean themselves. And whenever you talk about unclean lips, you're talking about leprosy there. Do you guys remember the whole story of leprosy and what they were commanded to do? And whenever whenever they had leprosy, what would they do? They would cover the mustache, it says. And it says, unclean, unclean, don't approach. Don't get near me or you're going to be unclean as well. A man of unclean limbs. What Isaiah is saying here is, I am a leper. I'm a leper. We're all lepers. In fact, he says, I'm a leper among lepers. I'm a man who I'm the chief of sinners, as Paul describes it. I am a man who I have sinned so much in me, and I need to get it out. But notice, Isaiah here doesn't actually ask for forgiveness. Interesting, right? You would think after he's saying, I'm nothing, God. You would think he would say, please forgive me, right? We don't know why exactly he doesn't ask for forgiveness. Possibly it was that he thought he was so inept that there was no way that he could have the honor of asking for forgiveness. But notice God forgives him. The seraphim comes and he takes a coal from the altar. And he doesn't go for the sacrifice of the altar. He just goes straight for the altar itself. Pulls out a chunk of coal. And he puts it to his lips and says, Now you are no longer a leper. Whenever God recognizes that we understand our state and we understand who we are, he also recognizes, as 2 Corinthians chapter 7 says, that godly sorrow produces repentance. He understood that Isaiah wanted to be well. He understood that Isaiah wanted to get back in a relationship with God. And he did that because he saw God sitting on his throne. Seeing God on his throne where he is helps us to see where we are. It helps us to make the final point. That seeing God on his throne motivates godly action. It's going to change us. It's going to make our lives go in 180 degrees difference. That we're going to be a new man. And that's what he says about Isaiah. In Isaiah, Isaiah makes the decision that I want to make my life what God wants to make my life. And so God asks the question, It says, then I heard the voice of the Lord. Now remember how great we said that must be. He said, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, here am I, send me. You remember that song? Here am I, Lord, send me. It's taken from this passage here. And I just get the picture if, is there any teachers here of elementary school kids? Anyone here? Okay, one or two. All right, we got a few here. And I'm just imagining, because I remember this is how it was whenever I was a kid, that you ask a question and says, who wants to help me? What's the overwhelming response? Ooh, me, me, pick me, pick me. I want to do it. And you don't even know what the job is yet. The same thing happens here. Isaiah is asked, who's going to go for us? And he says, me, me, I want to, send me. 
He doesn't even know what he's going to do yet. He doesn't even know what the duty is. But whenever our lives are transformed by God, it doesn't matter what the job is. We're going to have a desire to go out and do it. We're going to have every fiber of our being pushing towards those goals that God has for us. And so as we look at this passage, we then see that God tells him, here's what you're going to do. Go and tell this people. And he's got a message for that people. He says, go and tell this people. Does that sound familiar? Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. What's Jesus' command there? Go and tell this people. God has always sent His people to go and teach His Word. But here's the message. It might seem like an odd message, but you guys are probably familiar with the passage. It says, Keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. Render the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull and their eyes dim. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and return and be healed. My original idea for a degree that I was going to go into, I got my degree in communication. But my original idea was going to be public relations. I just like that idea of going and representing a business. So let's imagine that I'm a PR director for a moment. And I'm going for, let's just say, Coca-Cola. And they want me to go and tell a group of people, hey, you should buy Coca-Cola. But instead of telling them that, instead of going for the direct convincing, I instead say this. Guess what, guys? You're not going to listen. You guys aren't going to pay attention. And in fact, I know you're not going to buy the Coca-Cola. But God said to Isaiah, go and tell this people, you're not going to listen. You're not going to pay attention. You guys are all hard hearing. Go ahead. Go on. <coughs> Go tell them. It kind of seems disheartening, doesn't it? it? Kind of seems, as my dad puts it, kind of seems like a bummer. That you have everything from God, and he says, nobody's going to listen to you. And yet, we see that this passage is quoted in the New Testament as well. The passage is quoted in the New Testament in most of the Gospels and in Acts chapter 28 and verse 27. And it talks about each of these passages. Guess what? The Jews didn't listen. And guess what? The Gentiles didn't always listen. People do not listen to God's message for some reason. They have everything before them, and they reject it. They close their ears. They close their eyes. And in fact, it was Paul that said that it is foolishness to those who are perishing, to those who are already going to fall into sin and already making a decision in their life that I am not going to live my life how someone else wants me to live it, but how I want to live it. They're perishing. And they're not going to listen to the message. And I want us to look at one passage that actually does quote this verse. I want us to look in John chapter 12. John chapter 12, if you'll turn there with me. Let's back up to verse 37. John chapter 12 and verse 37. Though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him. So that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what he heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore, they could not believe. For again, Isaiah said, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. So you see, once again, the passage is being fulfilled. But there's a further fulfillment in this verse than just talking about the people not listening. Let's continue reading. Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. In context, who's the him talking about? 
but talking about Jesus. In context, Jesus is the one who performed the miracles. In context, Jesus was the one who gave the signs. In context, it was Jesus that they were not listening to. And here it says that Isaiah has fulfilled, has been fulfilled, that it was Jesus who was sitting on his throne. Jesus was the one in Isaiah 6. Jesus was Yahweh who was sitting on his throne. The great glory that we couldn't come in approaching to. Close enough. Jesus was the one who was in all his robes and arraignments. He was the one that the seraphim were surrounding. And they didn't listen to him in Isaiah's day. And they're still not listening to him today. Now lest I give you guys a downer for an invitation. I want you guys to listen to the rest of Isaiah 6. Turn back over there in verse 11. Because God hasn't really told him the full aspect of his message yet. Yes, people aren't going to listen. It's going to be tough. It's still tough today because they weren't listening to Jesus then and they're still not listening to Jesus now. But here's the facts. Verse 11, Isaiah asked, How long, Lord? Now, whenever people ask this question, usually, usually God didn't give them an answer. And we sometimes ask the same question. We might sometimes ask, All right, if you're going to send me to this work, how long do I got to do it? But God answers his question here. God answers his question because he sees a different aspect to his attitude. Instead of asking, How long do I have to? I think Isaiah is asking, how long do I get to? How long will you give me to preach this message? And here's God's response to him. Until cities are devastated and without inhabitants, houses are without people, and the land is utterly desolate. The Lord has removed men far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land, yet there will be a tenth portion in it. And it will be again be subject to burning. Like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains when it is felled, the holy seed is its stump. He says, until everything is wiped out. Basically he's saying, until your dying day, Isaiah, that's how long I'm going to give you. But here's the message. It's a message of hope. A message that says, the holy seed of God is the stump. He basically says, there will be a remnant. Everything else is going to be destroyed. Everything else is going to perish. Everything else is subject to burning, like burning a tree. And it falls over, and the tree is useless. But there's still that stump. And out of that stump, as Isaiah talks about in another occurrence, comes that branch. And that branch is Jesus Christ. The message of God is not just a message of nobody's going to listen. It's not a message of pessimism. It's a message of optimism. A message that says those few who are not perishing, who do want to listen to God, in the final day they will be saved. <coughs> That's the message to you and me. That God wants to save us. There may be some here. There may be some here who have not come to Jesus. Who are not listening to Him. I hope this morning I've opened the throne gates to you. And that we've been able to see just a glimpse inside. Because if we see even a glimpse inside, no matter if it's the full picture or just a picture of a picture. We will change our lives. And we'll get to work. Seeing the Lord on His throne instills godly fear. It produces godly sorrow. And it motivates godly action. Maybe you are a Christian. And your life has not been changed by the Gospel. Maybe you have been baptized and your life has not been changed by the Gospel. You're not following after God. 
And you need to set your life straight. You need to give your life completely over to Him. That you may follow His footsteps. And that you will say every single day of your lives, Here am I. Lord, send me. Because on that last day, on that last day, we will then get to be part of the remnant. Is that your desire? If you need to turn your life around, come back to the Lord. Now is the time to do that. But if you've not been baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, make a turn in your life. That you change your life wholly over to Him. And you will be His child. Whatever your need is, please let your need be known as we stand and sing.